Good evening, YouTube. Tonight we are discussing the masterwork of George Orwell, 1984, and one of its many parallels to the fundamentalist and evangelical Christian paradigms. In case you never heard of George Orwell, nor his novel, 1984, this book was published in 1948 and is the pinnacle of an oppressive, conformist, and tyrannical society using mind control, complete surveillance, and advanced technology to put the populace under the state's heel. The words and concepts of doublethink, Orwellian, and thought crime all originate from this novel. And yet you may be surprised. There are a great deal of parallels between 1984 and modern Christian fundamentalism. For example, we have an all-seeing, all-powerful monster who watches our every move, eternally looking for an iota of disloyalty or rebellion. In this case, we have Yahweh in one hand and Big Brother in the other. What's up next is that all people must live a very specific lifestyle, with no exceptions, and obey the laws given to them by the ruling few. This time we have the Bible and those who would claim to interpret its meaning and enforce Levitican law by doing so. On the other hand, we have the mandates of the party handed down with an iron fist. But before we get any further, we must address the issue of what is thought crime anyway? Unfortunately, there is no official definition to be found for thought crime. The closest that I could find is to even consider any thought not in line with the principles of the state, doubting any of the principles of the state. All crimes begin with a thought, so if you control thought, you can control crime. To quote the novel, thought crime is death. Thought crime does not entail death, Thought crime is death, the essential crime that contains all others in itself. Now you might wonder, what on earth does this have to do with Christian fundamentalism? Well, a lot actually. One of the lines I have heard is, if you lust after a beautiful woman, you are committing adultery in your heart. Even if you're single, sound familiar? After Googling and bras and gorgeous babes galore for this project, I must be a serial adulterer by now. All with no real sex. Honestly, I'm disappointed. This line of reasoning is absurd and borders on insanity. We shall address the concept of thought crime in two parts. The first part, we shall talk about one possible origin of thought crime within Christianity and why the faithful and the people who are in charge of the faithful are so attached to it. And in the second half, we shall tear into the paradigm like a Jar Jar cosplayer at a Star Wars convention, exposing a multitude of faults, inhumanities, and insanities that exist within it. I am no biblical scholar, and when I started researching this subject, I encountered a great deal of frustration. This is not something you can easily find on Google, but the closest thing I could find to an origin within Christian thought crime is this classical text, The Confessions of St. Augustine. This is one of those books that has all the literary enjoyment of invasive dental surgery while being devoured alive by fire ants. And yes, I had to read it in college. While I do not know if this is the origin of thought crime within Christianity, it is certainly a major contributor to it. The Confessions of St. Augustine were written somewhere around 397 CE by, swear to Buddha I am not making this up, Augustine of Hippo. No, not that hippo, this hippo, known today as Anababa, Algeria. Since this twit caused me so much pain in college, we shall refer to him as Augie from now on. No one worthy of the title of saint would write something so unbearably painful to read. The majority of Augie's book is a very, very long laundry list of I'm so sorry God, I'm so sorry about this, so sorry about that, 
I'm so sorry, forgive me this, and forgive me that. It goes on, and on, and on, and on. This idiot, in very painstaking detail, apologizes for every thought, deed, or word he might have said, had, or done from the moment he was conceived to the day he penned his confession. Now, you might think this an exaggeration, but I clearly remember him saying how sorry he was about the thoughts he had before he could form thoughts coherently, in case during that time he might have thought something to offend God. That's right, folks. Just in case his thoughts, while he was in diapers, were deemed to be sinful. Perhaps on some level he inspired the flagellants during the Dark Ages. For while they literally whipped themselves time and time again, our boy Augie here does it with his words. This book stresses that any action, even thinking about things that are in conflict with the supposed will of Yahweh, are a sin. Thinking about girls is a sin. Thinking about boys is a sin. Thinking about boys kissing boys is a sin. Thinking about girls kissing girls is a sin. And thinking about hetero kissing hetero is a sin. Thinking about booze is a sin. Thinking about food is a sin. Thinking about your own free will is a sin. Thinking about killing zombies is a sin, and so on and so forth. To Augie, free will is a horrible idea because it takes people away from God. Sounds like 1984's thought crime, right? After giving this a great deal of thought, I believe there are three main reasons why this idea of Christian thought crime has endured. Three little elements that those in power adore. Control being the first. I can only imagine centuries ago some leaders at the top of the Christian church discussing now that they have people ashamed of what words they might say by accident, and anything they might do that would displease them, how could they make people ashamed even further? So they could tighten their control over the populace. Ah, of course, their thoughts. One of the handful of things within the human experience that you have no control over. Because once you think of it, it is there. No filter, no chance, no how. Instant sin, and the instant need to gain control of said sin. Next up is fear. Imagine a story where your very thoughts were your enemy. There is a very old Twilight Zone episode where a child with inhuman powers demands so-called happy thoughts at all times with lethal consequences. This is virtually identical to Christian thought crime because your thoughts can betray you and send you straight to hell. So you better repent, go to church, and cough up that 10%. Lastly, we have guilt. Guilt is a wonderful way to control someone and a society at large. But every time a hot guy or a hot girl walks into the room and depending on your gender or personal tastes, are you supposed to feel guilty? Have you ever had an asshole boss and just wanted to beat the crap out of him? but you never touched them. Once again, must you be riddled with guilt? Personally, I consider this to be a wonderful form of stress relief without actually assaulting anyone or committing a crime. In the end, you've done nothing wrong nor illegal yet, but somehow you must still be ashamed? Now that we've covered a little history and a few ideas why people still accept this tribe, Let's talk about why this is a load of total, absolute, 100% pure nonsense. The first thing we must do is discuss the nature of thoughts. As I have said before, thoughts are among the most personal and unfiltered experiences we human beings have. For example, I have a challenge for you. No matter what, do not think a velociraptor Riding a shark, holding an RPG. Well, you thought of it, didn't you? Unless you have Tourette's or some other condition, you are able to censor yourself and control your body as you wish to. You can say what you want, 
and move as you wish and control to some degree how the rest of the world sees you. But your thoughts are another matter for two major reasons. Despite popular fiction, no one can read minds and no one is judged for their innermost thoughts unless they make them public. Also, your thoughts are created instantly. Once the thought occurs, it is there. That thought has been created, and no matter how much you might wish it otherwise, that thought still exists in your head. How long it stays within your mind and how much it influences your words and your actions is entirely up to you. The next reason that our thoughts do not make us the people we are is that we are what we say and do. That alone determines our worth or lack thereof. When idiots come to my door and do the whole knock-knock Jesus thing, I may have an urge to hit them in the head repeatedly with an axe for being so annoying. However, I have the capacity to filter my thoughts from my actions or my words if I choose to do so, and so can you. So, let's bring this to a close and expand and review on what we've talked about. First of all, this might have all started with our mental masochist Augie from Hippo and his ludicrously deep expose into his own self-hatred before God. Next are the matters of control, fear, and guilt. To have absolute power over the masses by attempting to dominate not only their words and deeds, but their very thoughts as well. I will leave you with three final reasons why thought crime is bullshit of the highest caliber. One, your thoughts do not affect reality. For example, right now I'm thinking about Sarah Palin being trampled to death by a horde of enraged moose. Well, that did not happen. I think that I am a Jedi. Can I use the Force? Nope. I think I can get girls like this, this, and this to hit on me left and right. Well, being married, I would have to politely decline, but nope, still not happening. Two, you cannot control whatever thoughts may occur within your own skull, and sometimes the most strange, inappropriate, and outright sexual thoughts might cross your mind, but if you don't act on them or voice them aloud, you've done no harm to anyone or anything. Three, it is clearly established with anyone who has a brain that thoughts alone do not affect reality for good or ill. Therefore, an individual's thoughts without the actions behind them have never really harmed anyone. Saying vile, hurtful things will wound your fellow man. Attacking physically, financially, or emotionally can do great harm to the intended target. But just pondering on aggression and misfortune, or just wishing bad things to happen, will cause no harm to anyone in the real world. In the absolute end, ideas, intents, and concepts without the will, words, or deeds behind them are worth the sum total effect they have on us all. That is absolutely nothing. This is The Wandering Taoist, reminding you to please don't overthink your life and take time to enjoy the little things.